Hi everyone. Uh, welcome to India's second metabolic health conference. My name is Mandar Gadre. I am a metabolic health consultant and a very proud member of DLife.in. DLife is uh, India's oldest, biggest, and the only award-winning low-carb platform. Shashikant Iyengar and Anup Singh uh, have brought to you this historic and scientific feast from India, titled Metabolic Therapies. And now. Let's meet our very special guest for this session, Mr. Akmal Albati. Uh, Akmal is a health coach, and he has put his own diabetes into remission by studying nutrition and following first a keto diet for 2.5 years, and then currently he's on the carnivore diet since last one and a half years. Uh, he has a very interesting personal story that we we'll, we are going to ask him more in detail about. Uh, thank you, Akmal, for joining. I am looking forward to the conversation. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks for joining. So let's get into it. Uh, so first, I want to ask you. You know, uh, could you please share your background in brief, and especially on your health journey, and uh, what was the trigger for you to start taking a deeper look at nutrition? Okay. Uh, it all started. Uh, I started my journey into learning about health and nutrition in March 2020. Mm -hmm. Immediately after I was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. With an HbA one C of eleven point seven, and my commitment to health intensified further when I was unexpectedly told I had melanoma, a type of skin cancer, mm. which fortunately stopped from spreading. While illness is often viewed as a suffering, I see my diabetes diagnosis as a blessing in disguise. It prompted me to learn about health and diet, a path I might not have explored otherwise. For as you have mentioned, for the past four years, I've been on, I've been following a ketogenic diet, two and a half years being on keto, and since last one and a half year on a carnivore diet, healing myself with every bite. Being passionate about health op optimization, I preach what I learn and practice on myself. I help people in my community with advice related to their health and diet related issues. So that's a brief intro about me. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, it's quite an inspiring story for all of us, and I'm going to get into some of those details. But I also noticed that uh, you know, in your in your online persona, you call yourself carb free, right? Carbs free. So uh, you know, how did you first come across this way of eating? Because this is not what is generally told. So can you please develop that contrast for us, for our viewers? That what was your uh, the typical advice that you got, and how did you find out about how to eat and start healing yourself? uh in mid 2020 while diving into the world of diabetes and keto i was binge watching watching different intermittent fasting and keto experts on youtube mm -hmm. during this period shawn baker showed up as a recommendation i watched a few videos of him but hesitated to explore shawn baker's content more due to the usual brainwashing about cholesterol saturated fats and mm -hmm. later on protein being converted to blood glucose Mm -hmm. but as time went on in and around in the same time i noticed that keto influencers were pushing more and more of greens and not recommending enough red meat in fact the quantity of red meat they suggested to eat was very small almost every video was focused on veggies greens nuts and seeds etc i started to feel uncomfortable with keto as i felt that somehow uh, vegetarianism is being pushed more and more into keto me personally if any day i had more veggies or greens in my meal and no or less meat meat i was i was not feeling well for example hunger pangs would kick in quicker and stronger than otherwise mm -hmm. i started to question question the need of plant materials in my diet and then something clicked in my mind that i'm doing keto and have reduced carbs intake most of the fruits are avoided as being non keto and i was only consuming berries occasionally starchy vegetables are non keto and i was consuming above the ground vegetables mm -hmm. and this made me feel good compared when i was on a standard diet now what would happen if i completely eliminate the remaining carbs and plant materials this time luckily three different carnivore experts uh, including shawn baker showed up as a recommendation on youtube and then during the last quarter of 2021 i started listening all the videos in their respective playlists starting from the oldest to the newest i was uh, listening these videos whenever and wherever i could 
while commuting to to and from the office while walking in the evening while having my meals this took around 9 months and then i found some more experts who are a wealth of information on the carnivore diet mm-hmm. so in september 2022 after after increasing my meat consumption since a month and feeling significantly better i made a decision to switch from keto to a carnivore or a zero carb diet and i have been having red meat and eggs every, ever since in all my meals and feeling much better than the keto days even though keto was uh, much better than a standard diet very interesting uh, one question i have is that these days i notice that you know there is all kinds of information floating around so as you mentioned you know you, you have been uh, going to these youtube videos and some other social media platforms as well uh, how would you sort of how did you st- start filtering some of those because all kinds of information will come to you and every author or every speaker speaks quite confidently about their own way right so how did you go about filtering that information because i think that is going to be interesting to some of our viewers yeah uh, it started in march 2020 uh, just before the uh, just few days before the lockdowns in the united arab emirates mm-hmm. so i was admitted in hospital for 3 days and th- throughout those 3 days i was being administered drips and was discharged after being informed i have type 2 diabetes Mm. on the day of being discharged my fasting glucose was 252 mm. crp was 30.76 and hba1c was 11.7 additionally glucose was 3 plus in the urine mm. i was prescribed a 1000 mg medication and told that it is for lifelong and mm. also that dosage will increase and additional medications will be added including insulin because di- because of diabetes related complications will surely arise this news came as a shock to me mm. the doctor also conducted tuning fork and joint test and informed me to come for follow ups for joint tests uh, every 2 weeks mm. for about four sessions okay. to monitor my condition as i learned more about diabetes later on i understood that those tests were conducted to assess the extent of diabetes related complications with amputation being a potential potential worst case scenario upon leaving the hospital and with all that in mind and having no prior knowledge of what is diabetes and its causes i felt as if i was i have been left blindfolded in a uh, forest and i'm mm-hmm. searching for a way out so within the first month i started noticing that blood glucose levels were linked with carbohydrate intake mm-hmm. so i became extremely strict with my carb consumption by using an app to keep a log of my food okay uh, and in this process i ended up eliminating sugar grains beans starchy vegetables most of the fruits and factory and, and factory made products from my diet i even lost the urge of tea and coffee and and, and eliminated it uh, for me since uh, since childhood i was a meat lover okay so i still continued continue uh, consuming some red meat although it was mm-hmm. lesser in quantities now but later a nutritionist advised on completely swapping it for steamed skinless chicken thighs or breasts however instead of uh, being instead of swapping all days i swapped it on some days only i also was having low fat yogurt and low fat milk as advised by the nutritionist due to the known false fear around surrounding animal fat mm. i relied on very few items from the carb exchange list provided as most of them were carb heavy mm-hmm. so uh, unknowingly i was following a keto diet mm. so mm. now when i look at my logs it was 20 to 30 grams of carbs in a meal okay. in a day i began to feel better as my body fat decreased and my blood glucose levels gradually normalized i just wanted to not only avoid getting any additional medications which i was told i will surely get but to also get off the single medication i was prescribed after now here is the interesting part after a few months i visited the doctor mm-hmm. he noticing my rapid weight loss he asked me if i was following a keto diet mm-hmm. and added that it is not safe i honestly replied that i wasn't aware of what keto was Upon returning home I started searching about keto on on the internet and realized that my dietary habits aligned with it. Mm. 
So thanks to the doctor for unintentionally introducing introducing me to the world of ketogenic diet. And after three months, doctor had to reduce my single medication dosage by half, as HbA1c fell to six point three. Okay. And from eleven point seven. And after another three months, he de-prescribed the medication, saying I don't need it any longer. At HbA1c was five point three. Very so, nice. And uh, just one more, uh, what, uh, how they diagnose diabetes? Like later, I learned about the importance of fasting insulin and fasting C-peptide numbers. Mm -hmm. No doctor had checked it earlier. Not right. single doctor. Now with normal HbA1c, I was curious to find my C-peptide and insulin numbers, and I remember having to argue with the doctor to have them checked. He dismissed mm -hmm. my request, saying I have a normal HbA1c. Hence, there is no need for the tests. He further said that many people with HbA1c exceeding 10 were managing their conditions with medication and insulin while enjoying normal life and that I should stop worrying, uh, worrying and start enjoying life. Even mm -hmm. suggesting I reintroduce rice, bread, sweet, etc. into my diet and not be strict and stubborn. Uh, I was. I just could not believe what he just said. Mm -hmm. I then went to another doctor who initially dismissed the need for further testing, right. saying that once diabetes develops, insulin and C-peptide levels remain elevated indefinitely mm -hmm. due to the genetic nature of diabetes. Mm -hmm. The normal what they say usually. However, I insisted him to conduct the tests, to which he finally agreed. I was mentally prepared that no matter how high the numbers come. I will at least have some benchmark to track. True. The results revealed a C-peptide level of 4.99 in October 2022. Okay. Followed by subsequent tests showing declining levels, 2.78 in January 23 and 1.58 in April 23, last year. Hmm. I then remember the doctor's words that diabetes uh, is genetic. Mm -hmm. And once you have it, it stays with you. And that fasting, insulin, and C-peptide numbers will always remain high. I can only imagine what the numbers would have been when I was admitted in the hospital in March 2020. Right, right. No, this is, I think you've been on a very interesting self-taught journey, I must say. Right, because yeah. you have explored the information yourself. Uh, you have clearly experimented on yourself. And, you know, proven, first of all, to yourself and then to others, uh, that you can put it in remission. So I think this gives hope to a lot of people who are listening. Uh, also, if I may ask, uh, what was your fasting insulin level? If you tested it, so is there a contrast that uh, you saw there as well? Uh, as I told you, uh, fasting insulin when I was diagnosed was not tested. Okay. So, uh, however, uh, the last three tests which were done, uh, for, I can, I have the C-peptide numbers. If you want, I can pull up the details. No, just ballpark is okay. But got it. We can come back to that. That's fine. Uh, understood. So uh, I, I have to ask. So you you were maintaining a, a sort of a ketogenic range of carbohydrates, right? About 20 to 30 grams. Yeah. So which naturally meant that you were eating a lot of protein and fat, of course. Right? And then as you know, in, in our subcontinent, there is a lot of fear of eating that protein. Right? And we tend to over rely on carbohydrates, you know, and people are afraid of proteins. So how did you get over that, uh, you know, because people around you must have asked you or your, you know, caregivers may have warned you about that. Uh, ever since childhood, I liked meat. Mm. I, I cannot deny that. For me, a meal without meat was incomplete. And whenever okay. my mother cooked a meal void of meat during my childhood, she used to say that today Akmal will say he is not feeling hungry. <laughs> As that was my excuse for not having a meal void of meat. Mm. So for me, the switch from standard diet to keto was an immediate decision one fine day. And okay. then from keto to carnivore again was immediate one fine day. Mm. In what instances, yes, I faced some initial challenges, uh, but I was, uh, I was having uh, the willpower mm. to go over it. You know, like I remember once I was in my office having my, my eggs and uh, a lady saying, seeing and saying to me, do you know that the weekly consumption of eggs is around three and you are eating 10 in the meal? Right. I just kept quiet, you know. 
So there is a push back, yes. But uh, personally, I've noticed that while there's some fear surrounding protein intake in people in, in Pakistan, but it's not as significant as the over-reliance on carbohydrates, especially grains, which is surely one of the primary culprits for various medical conditions. Mm -hmm. In the northern and northwestern regions of Pakistan, people still, especially the older generation, still primarily mm -hmm. consume red meat cooked in traditional ways in animal fat. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in Pakistan, some influencers and nutritional experts spread propaganda against red meat and animal fat, citing various nutritional studies, which obviously are biased and purely, purely executed. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, many people tend to believe what these people say but some return to their usual meat consumption after a few days. It's a common practice uh, here in Pakistan to have meat at least at least once or twice a week, especially on Fridays, mm -hmm. whether it's beef, mutton, chicken, fish, and dishes like nihari, organs, brain, testicles, liver are also popular. Mm -hmm. But another thing uh, which we as Muslims, we fail to notice that our religion itself has a very significant emphasis on meat. Mm -hmm. For instance, during happy occasions, like when a child is born, or something great happened in your family, bringing happiness, etc. Our religion instructs us to sacrifice ruminant animals, like a goat, sheep, lamb, cow, or camel. Mm -hmm. On Eid al-Adha, also known as the Big Eid in South Asia, we are told to sacrifice ruminants, and divide the meat into three more portions. Mm -hmm. One for ourselves, one for relatives, neighbors and friends, and one for the poor and the needy. There is no mention of cooking and distributing plant items. So in my personal view, consuming carbohydrates is nothing but a waste of time, money, and resources. You know, Furthermore, it only leads to illness, resulting in additional expenses on medical treatment. It is clearly stated in medical textbooks that humans require from carbohydrates provided that adequate amounts of protein and fats are consumed. Mm -hmm. If we eliminate carbohydrates from our diet, we will live a healthy life. However, if we keep carbs and remove or keep protein and or fat, our body will only be getting sicker by sicker. Definitely. Also, also, many people are not aware that even spices, pepper, etc. contain carbs. For example, turmeric is 72% carbs. Black pepper is 71% carbs. And in South Asia, almost everyone cooks using turmeric and pepper. We have ruined our taste buds so much that having a food without the laundry list of spices that the food is tasteless. So it will take time for the general uh, public to overcome this over-reliance on carbohydrates. Understood. Well, one thing I'm curious about is that as you mentioned, you you were a meat eater, you know, uh, uh, or rather meat lover. Uh, yes. But uh, help us understand. So, uh, have you had you tracked your carbohydrate consumption levels, uh, you know, before you were diagnosed, or maybe can you estimate for us so that we get an idea? Because you still had to sort of go through the diabetic journey, right? Uh, it was basically a mixed diet, standard diet. Hmm. You know, my favorite dish used to be a, a Yemeni dish called mandi. You know, you have the uh, roasted uh, cut of lamb mm -hmm. placed on a rice, on a platter of rice. Yeah. So, uh, it was typical uh, carbs and proteins and fat, fat mix, standard diet. Understood, understood. So this actually illustrates a good point that, you know, uh, as you know, in the subcontinent, even people who call themselves non-vegetarians, a lot of times they are eating meat, as you mentioned, maybe a couple of times a week, typically in fact once a week. That row also in one meal and, and a few pieces because it's still not the king of your plate, right? The protein and fat is still not the king of the plate. It's still a lot of carbohydrates. So that's why I was curious about you know those levels. Uh, another thing I want to ask you is, uh, you mentioned the right cooking practices, especially the animal fats. So, uh, and I know you also uh, create a lot of interesting videos on, on cooking and you, know, you uh, spread awareness. So uh, what are your go-to... Uh, you know, cooking oils or ghee, what, what do you like to use? Uh, during my carnivore journey, uh, I was initially I started using tallow, homemade mm -hmm. tallow. Mm -hmm. Then I started, I switched to ghee also for a change. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and now recently, since past one year, I'm using just chunks of uh, suet, the fat around the kidney of the cow, the, the, the fat chunks, cut into bite-sized pieces. So I just put it in the frying pan and the oil comes out and I put my steak in it. Perfect. Understood. And during during keto times, I was into coconut oil, MCT oils and all these things. Got it. Uh, I also have seen uh, sort of your weight transformation photos. So I want to ask yes. you about that as well because you experienced not just the blood glucose, which I imagine you were tracking, but also you saw uh, differences in you know how how you look. And so can you please tell us uh, what was the you know the weight loss journey as well? Uh, yes, the most the uh, the biggest portion of weight loss happened in the first uh, the first year. Okay, between March twenty to March twenty one. Mm-hmm. And I was, uh, like before being diagnosed, I was around 120 kg. Mm-hmm. Oh. So c- currently I am around 80. Mm-hmm. And during keto, I even reached, uh, someone won't believe it, I reached 53 during keto. This is very interesting because here you are saying that, you know, you ate a lot of uh, fat and protein, but you lost fat. So yes. uh, it's good for our audience to understand that uh, it, it's much more a hormonal issue than you know uh, just a caloric issue. Uh, got I'll it. just so, add one. I just add one point here mm-hmm. uh, about the fat. Body will keep the fat required. Any excess will be excreted. Hence, you get the loose tool when you're mm-hmm. on a carnivore diet. When you have excess fat, it comes out. It doesn't get stored. Very interesting. Uh, so, uh, as you mentioned in the intro, we want to come to your, uh, you know, diagnosis of cancer as well. Uh, and then maybe I'm going to just ask the two questions together and uh, then over to you. So, uh, first of all, please help us understand that journey and, you know, what happened uh, and how did you find out about it as well as uh, what's the relation between sugars or carbs in general and cancer? How do you look at it now? Yeah. Uh, during a routine visit, to the doctor in December 2020. Mm-hmm. The doctor was not feeling okay with my rapid weight loss. Uh, like he was unaware I was following a ketogenic diet mm-hmm. because he told me it's not good for health. So he told me he wants to do a physical examination of myself to see if he's able to find any abnormality on my body associated with the fair, with the rapid weight loss. Mm-hmm. So upon examination, he found an abnormal dark colored patch with an asymmetrical shape. It was located with my, between my two sh- my two shoulders, slightly t- towards the bottom. He asked me whether I was aware of it before. And I said, I don't recall uh, noticing anything as it is not a location which is seen easily or daily. Mm-hmm. He then suggested me to check, uh, check with the dermatologist to be sure it is not something abnormal. So I went to the dermatologist and after examining the patch, she suggested conducting a biopsy to send a sample to the lab for further analysis. Mm -hmm. When I inquired if it was a cause of concern, she just, she just explained that it doesn't, it didn't resemble a typical mole due to its shape and that we can only know about it once uh, the lab reports come. So I got the biopsy done in January 21. This was approximately 10 months after being diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. Mm. A few days after the procedure, I received a call from the dermatologist informing that the lab report is confirming it is melanoma. Mm. I inquired further and she asked me to visit her. And during the meeting with her, she explained that melanoma is a type of skin cancer. Mm -hmm. It shocked me. She advised me to consult with an oncologist as soon as possible. Um, I was feeling very overwhelmed by the successive health challenges within the past year. Mm -hmm. I couldn't help but think about my luck, wondering why, unfortunately, I seem to be encountering a new medical condition each year. Like previous year was diabetes and now I've got melanoma. I then scheduled an appointment with an oncologist and the oncologist said that I started developing melanoma and luckily the cancer cells died where they started and did not spread. Mm-hmm. 
I asked the cause of it developing. He said long exposure to sunlight is the likely cause, to which I replied that my my job is office related. So, and there is no significant outdoor work here or where I can get exposed to sunshine for long durations. Mm -hmm. And then he said that sometimes exposure to sunlight, even for shorter periods of time, uh, can result uh, this developing, especially in, in brown skinned people like South Asians. To which I replied that the part where it is found is always covered, whether I am in my house or outside. So I could not get a clear cut answer for it. Mm. I then asked him also, like, if it is possible to know, like, approximately when did it start, or when did it die off. He, mm -hmm. There's no answer from that. Uh, anyhow, then the oncologist now advised a precautionary measure of conducting a full body PET CT scan to ensure that it's no, it is not somewhere else. For mm -hmm. the scan, I was injected with a radioactive material, tracer, sugary tracer, normally it is. And thanks to God, the results came back clear. However, as a further precaution, doctor recommended surgically removing the flesh, fat, and skin surrounding the area where the dead cancer cells were located, mm. around three square centimeter area. So I then started to search more about cancer and its causes and cures online and found interviews of people who have cured cancer on ketogenic diet. And then I understood that the reason it did not spread and in fact went, went away is most probably it had started around the same time when I started my ketogenic diet. So because I had that time strictly removed sugar and carbs from my diet and following intermittent fasting as well, which I actually did for diabetes. And in the end, it turned out to be curing my cancer as well. Got it. Uh, Akmal, sorry, we, we sort of lost you just for a few seconds. Could you please uh, repeat the last couple of sentences when you uh, just to the sugar and the cancer connection, please? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I then started to search about cancer and its causes and cures online mm -hmm. and found interviews of people who had cured cancer on ketogenic diet. Right. And then I understood that the reason that it did not spread and in fact when I went away in the early stages was most probably coincidentally I had restricted, I, have, I had actually strictly removed sugar and carbs from my diet and following mm -hmm. intermittent fasting which I actually did for reversal of diabetes. Right. So it helped me there. Perfect. Perfect. And this is, I think, uh, first of all, congratulations on uh, putting these conditions in remission. Uh, and it's very interesting to know how they are so closely connected. Uh, the weight loss, it's a significant weight loss. Uh, then diabetes as well as uh, your personal story on cancer as well. Uh, so yeah, very inspiring. And I think it's going to be helpful for, for our audience. Uh, now, I want to sort of come to a macro picture, right? Uh, you know, in the subcontinent, as you know, a lot of people say that, okay, you know, I'm I'm sort of using lentils. Uh, we view them as, a lot of people view them as source of protein and they want to sort of mix it with rice and then they will say, okay, I'm getting all the amino acids. So, uh, does it really work for us uh, to get that enough nutrition? How do you look at it? Uh, before answering that question, is it okay I just go back to the cancer part a little bit? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, uh, I just share share some information. Sure. Uh, like, uh, first of all, we have to note that one of the contributors to cancer is the consumption of any factory made cooking oil, like seed oils, vegetable mm -hmm. oil, etc. Mm -hmm. These were originally used as engine or lubrication oil, as mm -hmm. we know, and then someone greedy and unethical decided to sell it as edible. To make yeah. not some but tons of money. Mm -hmm. As per experts, these oil stay in the body for eight to ten years, and during this mm -hmm. period, they are continuously damaging the cells to become dysfunctional, mm -hmm. and then the cells become what is a cancer cell. And mm -hmm. a cancer cell requires many times more energy to function compared to a normal cell. Mm -hmm. So, uh, consumption of cooking oil and carbs leads to medical conditions showing up. For some, it might be kidney issues, for some blood pressure, for some diabetes, for some heart disease, for some cancer, etc. 
but all these issues can be cured if we remove the things that cause and feed it. So I see it this way, the oils along, along with other factors mm -hmm. will help create the fire, which is cancer. And the sugar is the fuel for the fire to spread. Mm -hmm. So, and regarding the second part, uh, like for the fuel sources of cancer, they basically have two main sources, glucose and then amino acid, glutamine. So the easiest way for us to make sure that the cancer cells are well fed is having carbs through the mouth. So mm. in theory, we ourselves are happily feeding cancer cells one bite at a time or one sip at a time. You know? So if we just eliminate the carbs and, and as for the glut, uh, glutamine, uh, the glutamate, the amino acid, it's very frequent, it's abundant in the body. So for those who are, who are on adv in advanced stages of cancer can use glutamine blockers strategically along with some uh, supplements like physetine, etc. And multiple day fast to get the GKI index lower than one, one or below. It mm -hmm. can help a lot. So uh, that I wanted to add there about the cancer part. Now, uh, your second question was about? So mixing of, uh, so when you do a mixture of lentils and rice and sort of looking yes. at it as a protein source, so what do you think about yes. this? It's unfortunate that people who have been misled, misled to believe strongly that uh, lentils, beans, chickpeas, or what is known as in, South, in South Asia, as chana, etc., the go-to staple for health and nutrition. Mm -hmm. Fats and proteins are a fundamental requirement of the human body. Mm -hmm. Our body does not know fat and protein. It knows individual amino acids which combine to form protein and individual fatty acids which combine to form fat. However, when considering plant-based sources of protein, it's common for them to be void or deficient in certain amino acids, mm -hmm. resulting in an incomplete amino acid profile. Some amino acids uh, are act as limiting factors, meaning that if one, am one amino acid is insufficient, a specific, a specific metabolic process requiring a certain ratio of that amino acid cannot happen as needed. Mm -hmm. So what is said is to consume a diverse range of plant-based food items in, our, in your daily meal to achieve a well-balanced diet to get all the required amino acids. Mm -hmm. So we have a platter of what is called a rainbow plate. Mm -hmm. Then comes the issue to get all the vitamins and minerals. So add in more items to the daily mix of a well-balanced diet. Mm -hmm. But here, what people fail to notice that under the context of completing the amino acid profile, vitamins, minerals, we are increasing the carbs in the plate. Mm. Then there is the issue of amount of nutrients, vitamins and minerals in the plant items. Uh, as, which as per a report published in USA, is on decline since last 70 years and getting worse. As mm. per the report, there is at least 25 to 50% average reduction in vitamins and minerals in fruits and vegetables so far. Then you have the issue of the effect of anti-nutrients, including fiber, which block the absorption of vitamins, minerals, nutrients by the body from the food we eat. This mm. has been shown scientifically and published. So what we do in, instead, we increase the portion size. And what we are actually doing, you are increasing the carbs by many folds, mm. just to cover the daily requirement of nutrients. And anyhow, we still cannot get enough of the nutrients from plants no matter how much we eat. Mm. So we are only getting undernourishment, wasting money and getting sicker and sicker with each morsel and sip. Excellent point. Also, I noticed that uh, in your way of eating that you have been doing currently, uh, there is no fiber either, right? Virtually no fiber. So, you know, but isn't fiber essential? And, you know, uh, that's what we have been told. So what's your experience on it? And how do you look at the science of it? Uh, on a carnivore diet, due to the absence of anti-nutrients and fiber from plant items, body is effectively absorbing as much, as much of nutrients, vitamins, and minerals as possible. Mm -hmm. Therefore, there is, very less waste, uh, there is very less waste generated for excretion. Now, note that I'm against keto, but as I was, I was having lots of fiber on keto, as people normally do, my bowel movements were same as that when on a standard diet. Mm. Some days even bad. 
very bulky stool, hard to pass, etc. This this was inspired me having too much dietary fat than on a standard diet. Mm-hmm. But switching to a zero fiber diet, my bowel movements are best since decades. Less frequent bowel movements, easy to pass, less time, meaning saving a lot of time for other things in life. During the initial days of carnivore, it was around seven to ten days, but now it is somewhere around once in every two to five days. Then uh, some people say that fiber softens the stool. Mm-hmm. However, it has been found that moisture in stool does not vary irrespective of how much fiber and water is consumed. Mm-hmm. Then a small percentage of some people say a small percentage of dietary fiber gets fermented in the gut. and this releases gases and since our gastrointestinal tract is very small compared to a herbivore animal even a small amount of this gas then causes bloating in humans which we complain of frequently on a standard diet then mm-hmm. also uh, one interesting part here about fiber during fermentation of fiber by the good bacteria in in the gut mm-hmm. a short chain fatty acid is released which is important for the functioning of the cells or colonocytes mm. that are in our colon like these cells are what are lining the uh, the walls of the colon these colonocytes can get exactly what they need in an easier way through ketone bodies on a ketogenic diet mm. through consumption of animal fat especially pure butter so is saturated fat bad for health mm. Right, Then, right. No, uh, thanks for yeah. mm-hmm. thanks for that explanation as well. So I think that helps us understand the role of fiber. I want to also ask you, uh, you know, in our subcontinent, so just like in India, I was also looking at the numbers of you know diabetics in Pakistan as well. Uh, and unfortunately, in both these countries, those numbers are increasing. Uh, what do you think the uh, you know primary reason is? Because we have been told. I mean, you were just like you were told it is genetic. But how do you look at it now after your journey? uh it's let me let me say this way the primary reason for this is the widespread misinformation spread by medical professionals and nutritional experts the conventional ones i mean mm-hmm. okay and then religious clerics are also doing their part by misinterpreting the various aspects of diet mentioned in our religion so, mm. so to support those false dietary claims by medical professionals Mm. like doctors and nutritionists don't even understand hypoglycemia is not this not a signal that no it's not a signal that it is time to eat or drink something but rather what is being consumed is not proper and sustainable for the body mm-hmm. so we as muslims have a golden chance every year to reset our dietary habits when we drive fast from pre dawn till sunset for 30 days straight mm. but what happens is our average daily consumption of carbs increases mm. compared to the remaining 11 months of the year for mm. example yeah, if a person consumes two samosas a week for 11 months that makes it eight samosas however during ramadan if we assume if a person consumes a minimum of two samosas per day that is 60 samosas a month Mm. add to that paratha roti rice pakoda jalebi fruit sharbat etc and all this is consumed at least twice a day if no snacking is done at night all this okay. because we have been brainwashed to believe that these are part of the local or cultural food and are important mm. and additionally uh, for as for us as muslims i would say uh, the the clerics the religious clerics are spreading misinterpretation of uh, the religion from the dietary point of view uh, for example they say dates and honey are a must have commodity in modern times especially if you have medical conditions including diabetes and that it is a cure mm. under this this excuse diabetics binge on these items especially on dates in ramadan uh, there's there's a country which compared to pakistan has a higher population density no significant natural resources suffers more frequent and severe natural calamities 
percentage of people having diabetes in that country is 78.5% less compared to Pakistan. But if we look at the food in Pakistan, people consume 80% less meat and 83% less eggs compared to that country. Okay. Additionally, that country has the largest number of centenarians in the world. And this number has been increasing since past many years. Mm -hmm. And then we have the problem of uh, roti and rice as a way of way to have the food getting into the mouth. Mm -hmm. well, the, I see it like this, that if there is a need to use something like roti or rice to place food in the mouth, or you require an ingredient to make a food palatable, either the food is not food or is being cooked in a wrong way. You know, then, but people then say, nah, okay, uh, we have these issues, medical issues, but eggs are costly, meat is costly. They have this excuse. Mm -hmm. but they fail to notice that, you know, a roti from a bakery or tandoor, a cup of tea, handful of nuts, seeds, any snack can easily be replaced with a single hard-boiled egg and be a be healthy nutrient dense option in the same price mm. you know but they don't mind wasting you know or consuming five plus rotis in a meal or having mm. multiple cups of tea in a day you know for them that is okay yeah very well put and we also tend to measure how much we ate by the count of the rotis right we say that okay yeah. i ate three rotis or i ate only one so i ate less unfortunately that's the reality so yeah uh, thanks for such an illuminating discussion we are drawing close to the end of the session. Uh, yes. May I request Shashi uh, to join in, please? Yeah, Anup is also there. Anup, get Anup in. Anup, yes. Yeah, Anup is here. Akmal, thank you very much for accepting the invite and sharing your inspirational journey. So what started as, as, as a diabetes uh, uh, recovery or remission journey, in that you also found that you had cancer and you were able to successfully uh, uh, get it under control or it got control automatically since you are following yes. a, almost sort of uh, a, a dietary pattern which is now recommended as a protocol for, for cancer patients by many top thought leaders like Thomas Seifried or, yes. or Nasha Winters. We had them... Uh, couple of days and then today we are going to have one more Dr. Alex talking on cancer but I think it's a very inspirational story and that's why we thought we will get you even though you are not a doctor but nevertheless we need individuals who will come and tell us their success stories with you so very and you also gave us some insight about what is happening in your country where the diabetes prevalence is very high it is more than 20 percent whereas even India is having 11 percent but you all is very 20 26 percent Something is seriously wrong with the food, the kind of excess carbohydrate, sugars, and even let us say uh, the kind of seed oils you use, which everything really exacerbates everything. So thank you very much. Anup. Yeah, Mr. Akmal, first of all, congratulations for being healthy again by thank dumping the, the dumping the uh, industrial diet dressed as standard diet or standard dietary recommendation. I have no hesitation in saying that that diet is crap, right? And we concur on to many points, especially on fiber. You highlighted the fact that fiber, you know, it. Uh, I normally say fiber is not intelligent. If it slows down glucose, uh, you know, rise, it will slow down everything. And you highlighted through numerical data that increase of fiber, you know, it is impeding minerals, vitamins, everything. So fiber. I'm is with you. I'm with you about this thing. Like I, I personally believe complex carbs is nothing but a, a tool for deceiving people. Yes, yes. Because at the end of the day, at the end of the day, carbs in any form, if they are being converted to sugar, body will yes. need the same amount of insulin, whether you exactly. drink pure glucose or you eat, you know, equivalent amount of tons of uh, vegetables. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you for coming. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, Akmal. Thank you, Akmal.